All right, welcome into Gridiron Icon. I couldn't be more pumped up for this guest, somebody that I got to watch play in both college and the pros, and just an all-around good guy. Actually, I got to watch his dad play too, which is really cool. And we got to talk about this Cromwell jersey uh, like we did off the air. I am joined by middle linebacker, All-American, national champion, three-time pro bowler, all-pro, founder of Zone In CBD, and host of the Believe in Seahawks podcast. And did we mention he's also an actor, the great Rofa Tatupu. Welcome in, man. How are you? I'm good, brother. Thank you for having me. You bet those bios, you probably go, ah, another one. <laughs> hey, I'm just glad I got some acting credentials now, right? That <laughs> man, I got to ask you about that before we even get into football. Like, you're an actor now. I mean, look, you got the looks. Some of us didn't get that blessing, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm the uh, wait. There's cable. I'm the cable version of the Rock. So there's Direct TV and then cable. He goes right for Dwayne Johnson, the Rock. But yeah, I'm I'm the lower end, right? But um, no. So what happened? I, I think they wanted. Um, it was a Washington Lotto, and I think they wanted either Cam Chancellor or Doug Baldwin, and neither of them could do it. And so I think they landed with they got they got stuck with me. Is how it happened. Oh my God, I love it. God, you got to go defense. I mean, Cam is a oh. stud, but look, dude, you're kind of a legend in Seahawk land. I know you don't like hearing that from fanboys and those of us out here in this world, but you're a rock star in Seahawks history, man. I, I was a big fan of yours, of course, the connection to SoCal too. So uh, awesome, an actor. All right. Yeah. I, it was, I tell you, it was, it was so I've done a couple things for them before. Um, and like every time I just show up, it's a quick shoot. There's no talking, and then yeah, I'm, out of, I'm out of there like an hour. So I show up, and the dude comes to the dressing room and hands me a script, and I was like, "Yo, what the hell is this?" <laughs> he's like, "Oh, you got it." He's like, "You're gonna be here for like seven hours," and he's like, "These are your lines. This is the storyboard." And I was like, "Oh my god, dude!" I, it was a, it was a trip, but you know, it was it was fun. You know, um, definitely something I enjoyed doing because it was a good crew, and uh, we had a lot of fun with it. So is it easier, I mean, as a guy who's never done any, I've done a couple of commercials where I'm going to talk about that, but as a guy who's never done anything like that, is it easier than football? Because I hear there's just all this downtime where you're like sitting there staring off into outer space waiting for your line. But it was scary as shit, first of all, like reading, <laughs> reading lines. It's like they got all this equipment. There's like 50 people on set. There's a bunch of, you know, people, that actors that are standing in or – and in the background and, and we're all like kind of doing it, but it, it all depends on me delivering the lines. And I will say this, I was zoned in. I did not flub one line uh, in the whole seven hours. So I was I was proud of myself for that. But how, how funny is this? We go to the radio, so I had to do a radio bit for them the next day. And I couldn't say one line correctly. I mean, every single, <laughs> I had to go, hey, let me take that again. Let me get that again. <laughs> so. I, at least, you know, just like football, when the big games came around, I was ready to play. Uh, the practices, not so much. He just nails it when it counts. I, yeah, God, man, I that whole it gives you a whole new understanding now. When you watch a movie, you're like, yeah, that ain't as that ain't as easy as it looks, <laughs> right? Yeah, it, it's incredible what they do. And then, of course, uh, on the Believe in Seahawks podcast, both Katie, my producer, and Brett, they are Hollywood actors. Uh, they've done a lot of things. Yeah, I did um, not know that. Brett was on an MTV show for, for many years called Awkward. Katie's been in a ton of movies. Yeah, so, and that all just kind of came together. I was down promoting Zone In on um, Zone In CBD down at the Super Bowl when the Niners and the Chiefs played. I jumped on as a guest for their, their uh, Seahawks pod. They've been doing for a year. And then they're like, hey, that was fun. Why don't you come back like next month and talk some, you know, draft. And I did. And then they're like, yo, if you're not doing anything, of course, the pandemic hit. And I was like, I'm not, I was like, bro, I'm not doing shit. Hit me up. <laughs> I'm sitting around in my underwear. I'll be on the show. <laughs> I've been in this room for three years. <laughs> <laughs> You're so not alone. God, that's wild, man. I didn't know that. I listened to, and folks, we're going to plug it a lot here, but Believe in Seahawks podcast and the Believe Network. Go check it out. I listen to it all the time. And God, you guys have great chemistry, man. It's a great show. Thanks, brother. So they, they added with you. They added with you. Okay. All right. We got to talk football. That's what you're known for until you get to Dwayne Johnson status. And I see you on every commercial and every Disney movie and everything. We're still going to hit you up for football because damn, you're a good football player. So let's talk about football. How did you get into football? Was football your first love no. for, for the guys listening out there? I know you started out in Maine when your dad, you yeah. were on the East coast. 
how'd well, you get into football? Did did you just fall in love with it? From the time, I mean, my first like stuffed animal was not a stuffed animal. It was a football. It was it was one of those Nerf footballs. I still got pictures of me like going to bed with that thing. It's um, it was you know it's what my dad did. My dad played 14 years in the NFL. Uh, of course, he went to SC as you mentioned, and uh, and then 14 year career. And so I grew up going to the stadium, grew up going to the locker room, you know, the training room, equipment room, all that stuff. It seemed it felt like. I was born to do this. And even though it didn't always look like I would do this, you know, as of course, you know, I took the path less traveled, uh, you know, didn't get really recruited out of high school, um, you know, went to Maine and then found my way to SC. But it was, that was my vision from the time I was six, seven years old. The first year I ever played was I wanted to do what my dad did. Wow, man. I love that. Of course, I was going to ask you the impact he had. For, for fans listening, people watching this podcast, uh, his dad was a stud ball player, special teams ace, running back slash fullback, did it all back in a time when players did it all. I mean, they – and I mean, you started out even when you were in high school. Didn't you play some quarterback, some running back? The typical best guy on the team gets to play all the great positions. <laughs> yeah, so one of my best friends, phenomenal quarterback, he – um I mean, he grew about four inches from eighth grade to freshman year. And now all of a sudden he's six three, and so, and he was a phenomenal athlete. So he's like, I'm just gonna go play basketball. And so we lost our quarterback. And so, <laughs> and I had never thrown a pass, like, but I could, you know, I could remember all the plays. You know, very uh, cerebral player. You know, smart, and you know, um, just I studied the game so much that they're like, well, he's got a strong arm. He'll figure it out. You know, and I mean, I, I figured it out. But what's crazy is. You know, I put all my time into defense because I love I love playing linebacker. I love, I mean, Junior Seau, um, all the greats. And then, you know, you take it a step further because, you know, like Junior, Erlach, or Ray Lewis, I, you know, I wasn't going to be able to do all the things that those guys could do. They were a lot more, you know, physically gifted. So I, I had to look at guys that were similar in stature. And, I mean, Sam Mills just went in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Jesse Fuggle, London Fletcher, Dexter Coakley, Dat Wynn. I watched all these guys. I mean, every single move they had, and um, it was incredible. And then, like, I got to meet Zach Thomas my rookie year when I went to the Pro Bowl. It was absolutely insane. I mean, I got wow. to learn so much football just from sitting down and having a meal with him. Um, I'll, I'll, man, I'll cherish that memory forever. But that's – so my only offers out of high school were to play quarterback. And then – you, <laughs> you were like a feared hitter, man. How did that happen? I, um, <laughs> What was it? Rutgers, Temple, and UConn were the wow. only schools that offered me. And they were like, you know, they come to my school and they're like, hey, so we run a pro-style offense. Uh, and I was just like, why are they talking to me about offense? And so, you know, I'm you know, he's like, do you have any questions for us? And so I start asking them about the defense. How many, how many linebackers are you returning? You know, like I was already doing my, you know, business analysis on like, what are my chances to start and play here? And they were like, they answer all the questions. They're like, well, what? What do you, you know, we want you as a quarterback. And I was like, quarterback? I, <laughs> You're like, what? I stood up, I shook their hands. I go, all right, fellas, I mean, this meeting's over. I got to get back to class because there's no way I'm going <laughs> to. I And I asked them, I said, hey, if I don't play quarterback, if I don't start as a freshman, which they laughed at, <laughs> can yeah, I go but you got to say that, yeah. You want to, right? You believe in yourself. I go, can I go over and play linebacker? And they're like, and then two of them were like, we didn't even know you played defense. And I was like, oh, what? And so, you know, Maine came in out of nowhere and they were like, hey, we just want you on the team, you know, but we really, we would love you at linebacker. And they had, at the time, they had Stephen Cooper, who was an eight-year pro with the Chargers. Um, they had sent a couple other guys to the league. And then in that class that I came in with, uh, Brandon McGowan, he, um, he, got, he was our outside linebacker. He got converted into safety with the Bears, played there and the Patriots for, I think he was in the league for eight years also. So it was um it was a, it was a stacked roster over there, but that that's how I ended up in Maine. God, man! I mean, for everybody listening, you're kind of rolling with that whole Cooper Cup thing going on right now, where it wasn't highly recruited out of high school, ends up being a Pro Bowler and an All Pro. Uh, in his case, MVP of the Super Bowl. I mean, kids, it's gamble not, on yourselves, man. It's that's not the, where you, it's not where you start, right? In life, it's not where you start. It's how hard you work and, and where you uh, end up, and. Um, with the vision, you know, being NFL. Um, and that was the only I Look, I love my time at Maine. Um, the only reason I left was because 
I was not going to wow them at the combine. Actually, even if I won two Buck Buchanan awards, you know, the greatest defensive player at Division One AA, I don't even think that I would have got invited to the combine, even if I did that. So I had to, like you said, I had to bet on myself, and um, you know, I, I took the scholarship um, after that to SC, and um, and I, I really, you know, I believe everything happens for a reason. I landed in, a, I couldn't have landed in a better situation um, than I did. With, with all the talent that Pete brought in year after year, starting with uh, the, the class before I got there, um, which was it was loaded with like Matt Liner, uh, Mike Williams, a couple other guys. It was it was insane. God, I mean, look, people consider those USC teams you played on some of the best college football teams in the history of the game, and it's unbelievable. So, God, I mean, the culture shock from Maine to Southern California had to be a little something for a young guy, I'm guessing. Uh <laughs> I felt like I went back in time when I, I went from Massachusetts to Maine. And I felt like I went back, you know, a couple of years, and then I felt like I went forward into the future 10 years when I went out to, to L.A., God, hey, they got computers out here. No, it's like, that's wild. I, but look, aside from just the East Coast to West Coast thing, I mean, you are part of what is considered linebacker you. I mean, your name is right there with Junior, with the Matthews, with Rivers, with, you know, just a whole really host. Chris, yeah. Clay, Chris Clay. Chris Claymore played for the Rams for a while, Vikings Rams. Uh, yeah. I mean, these are great linebackers, man. How does USC so consistently turn out stud linebackers? I mean, I mean lot, what's your take them, on that? A lot of them are from Cali, you know? And I think yeah. we, it started to branch out when Pete got there. You know, Pete started going after the top 10 in every position. Like, that's when, you know, we, we still got Ray Maluga, but you bring in a Keith, Keith, Keith Rivers, Kaluka Mayava. Yeah. Uh, oh Clay God. Matthews. Clay Matthews was already there, you know? Yeah. And then, um, and then we brought in uh, Ryan Cushing from from Jersey, and you you send in you send in you know Ken Norton Jr., a legend, into the living room of an eighteen year old kid. That that guy won three Super Bowls, went to several Pro Bowls. That I want to do what he did. So, I, I mean, I gotta feel like that was the biggest bargaining chip. Like, hey, okay, go sign him, Nort. And I mean, I don't think he gets enough credit for for signing all those recruits. Um, and developing him into pros. And then you saw what he did when he got to the NFL with Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright and that linebacking core. I mean, everywhere he's went, he's put together a, a great, a great group. And um, it's it's you know largely in part due to him. And I'll tell you, Ken Norton Jr., you know, throwing a as clearly I'm a Rams fan. We're not gonna let that keep us from talking, but uh <laughs> have been my whole life. I was I was a fan of your dad, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. Um you know, Ken Norton was the guy who who coined that whole same old sorry ass Rams thing. He was part of those Niner teams that really grinded my gears, man. And he's your coach. Oh man, I know, I know. He's you know, and he's I learned so much from him. He's one of the greatest motivators. Um, you know, forever grateful for Nort and just uh, you know, he's a he's a father figure to a lot of us, man. Yeah, it's still a great coach to this day. And man, it's it's amazing what he's been able to accomplish. So, okay, so you've had a unique experience in that. You played for Pete Carroll as a college guy, a young guy, still maturing. And then you played for Pete Carroll when he comes from the Seahawks ever so briefly. Yeah. What was that like? How has Pete Carroll evolved or did he evolve in that time period? Because everybody knows he's a great motivator and recruiter. Yeah. I don't. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I mean, that had to be a unique experience for you. You kind of went from a young guy with him to a brief yeah. time as a pro. Yeah. How and did he change? Got, I mean, does he chop got, his gum different or what is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's that? I'm surprised he didn't invent the jaws, the jaws sizer. What is that? You seen that? Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those late night TV. No, I thought I've seen it, Lofa, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I figured they would have went for him as the first, you know, uh, endorsement for that thing. But God, a um, gum company. Somebody should be hitting him yeah. up. He should. Right across I mean, his chest. Yeah, Pete, you know, it was uh, Pete, he didn't really change. I mean, uh, that that was what was, you know, obvious. It worked there. And I think the only reason it didn't work the first time, it's hard to be a first time coach in the NFL yeah, because yeah. you have to put together a staff. I don't care how good you are, it's the staff around you that, that's got to, you know, be able to do their job so that you can, you know, make, you don't want to micromanage. And he doesn't, he trusts his guys to get the job done. And it's why he had 
a 10 year, 11 year run at SC. And then the same thing, he's mirrored it here, uh, winning championships in like the second and third year at both places. It's incredible. And, um, but uh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't change. And that was refreshing to see. And, um, but and then I got to coach for him for two years. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. I mean, you actually, you went yeah. from recruited to college to the pros being his middle linebacker to then you're coaching for him. What was that like? Did you like coaching? Tell us about that. I love coaching. I, really? Oh, my God. See, I, okay. I, I for two years, you know, my contract was two years. So uh, after the first year, obviously, it's a, it's a very big time commitment, you know, much more uh, than, than you are as a player. I thought, you know, I thought I, I thought I worked pretty hard as a player. Uh, usually, one of the first in, one of the last to leave. Well, you know, when you leave, the coaches are still there for another five six hours. <laughs> so God, man, it's um. But you know, when you're having fun and you love it, it goes by quick. It really did. But it's just my kids were three and six at the time, and I missed both of their birthdays the very first year because one because when I, we were having kids, they were kind of planned around the season, right? Because you want to be there. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> NFL wives. That's what happens oh, in the, That's how crazy it is. Uh, you'll wow. see like, a lot of kids born in the off season because you're planning to make sure that you're there. You're not at a game when uh, the babies do. So the first one, born in February, just had his 11th birthday. And then the other nice. one was July. During, so we were at the combine for the first one. I was at the combine for the first one. And for the second one, um, I was at um, camp. Camp starts late July and his is July 20th. So it's like right there, it went off in my mind that I was like, man, this is, this is too large of a commitment at a time when this is when the kids need me. You know, they're not going to listen yeah. to me. A couple more years, they're not going to listen to me. I, you know, we, we were kids once. Oh, we, yeah. <laughs> they don't listen, listen at all. As well. <laughs> yeah, they don't care. They don't matter if their dad was in a Pro Bowl middle linebacker. He's dad. I don't <laughs> yeah, care. I'm not afraid of him. <laughs> no. So, you know, I just put in that perspective. And then, you know, like, like we talked about before the show, you know, my dad, he passed at 54. And you just never know in life. And so, right. um, you know, I'm spending as much time as I can with them. And uh, I'm grateful for it. And, and I, I still, you know, I got the podcast. I stay around the game. I go to all the Seahawks home games. Um, the team, they're gracious enough to, to let me come around for charity events and stuff. So they keep me in the fold. It's, it's the greatest organization, you know, there is. And, um, and I think when the time's right, I will go back, you know, hopefully the Seahawks in some capacity, whether it's scouting or, or as a coach, I would love to. It was, and that, I mean, you can't, you coach the two greatest line, in my opinion, the two greatest linebackers to ever play for the Seahawks. Bobby and KJ, I, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. I'll tell you what, man, Bobby Wang. So first and foremost, how special are these wives that are married to you guys as players? It's unbelievable the stuff they do. We could do shows on the wives. The wives, but, absolutely. But kudos to you, man. I mean, I was all teed up to ask you why you left coaching after only a couple of years. And now we all know. I mean, and God, that's so important. We just saw Van Jefferson of the Rams and Odell. Parent, I mean, Van had to run off from the celebration. His wife started giving birth. <laughs> I mean, but how, how special was that day, though? Wow. That he, he gets his ring, and then, I mean, yeah, you got all off season to party. You know, hopefully, you know, you got to put that win behind you eventually to get to the next to defend the title. But the same day that he gets his Super Bowl, biggest win of his career, gets to go watch his baby born. And I mean, that's. Uh, that's that's unreal. the greatest memory like anybody could ever have. It's absolutely unreal, man. I love that. I love that you touched on your coaching career because I I was all teed up to ask you about that. Now when you know family first, and listen, I don't care who's listening or watching. That's absolutely critical to life. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Okay, so tell us about the C. And by the way, Bobby Wagner's a stud. I and mean, there's a famous story in Rams fan world where Jeff Fisher threw things across the room when the Seahawks snuck up and grabbed him one pick before the Rams had a shot at him. So every time I watch Wagner play, I kind of groan a little bit. Um, <laughs> but We feel the same way about Cooper Cup. Ah, that's God, <laughs> Eastern Washington. Good point, man. Good oh. point. God, the NFC West is loaded with studs and unbelievable. Okay, so looking at your career as a middle linebacker, and, and this is the fun, we're going to do the fanboy fan, fun stuff. Did you have any pregame rituals? What's life like for an NFL middle linebacker, Pro Bowl middle linebacker? But leading up to a game, are you like eating the same oatmeal every morning and watching videos of quarterbacks getting smashed or what? <laughs> no, I mean, I was 
you know, I, I, all the work was done, you know, pre, you know, like I, you don't, now that's not the time to go back and look at notes or anything like that. Like you, you better have invested that time wisely when you had it. And, um, you know, now it's just time to cut loose and have fun. So, uh, I didn't have any rituals, but my, my playlist would, would fluctuate. Like, um, if there was a game that like, you know, not meaningless, but didn't really, it was, it was a, a shitty team, you know, it's horrible to say. There's a few out there. <laughs> I would, I would, I would turn that volume up as loud as it could go. And like, it would be just some either hardcore gangster rap or, you know, like Tupac, right. was, Tupac was my favorite or, um, I listen, you know, like Marilyn Manson, like some hardcore rock, like anything to get me going that angry, angst, pissed off, you know, mood. And then, I love it, man. And then if it was like the biggest game, I always, it's crazy. I had to listen to like reggae, like uh, really? Kyle Fultz, Bob Marley. I had to bring it down Wild. because I was already fucking on up. Yeah, I was through the roof already. And like I had to bring it down because you never want to be too high up and you never want to be you want to be zoned in for lack of a better term. Yeah. I, I mean they're spoken from a captain of the defense. That that's an important thing for any young players listening. You know, be controlled rage. Is that the right term? That's that is a perfect term. <laughs> so who okay, so looking at you as a linebacker, and man, you were one of the best when you were healthy and playing during that time period. We, we got to ask you all the cheese questions, okay? Who was really tough to tackle for you? And I'm and I'm praying you say number thirty nine at that time from the St. Louis Rams because you know oh, I like to be some Steven Jackson. <laughs> that guy. I watched you hit him. <laughs> that man. That when when I could get a hold of him, um, he had some of the greatest feet. You know, for a guy that's two hundred forty pounds, wow. you're not supposed to be that light and quick on your feet. Um, you know, so yeah, Steve was incredible. I mean, I been battling him since college when he was at right. Oregon State. Um, yeah, he was absolutely, he was hell to deal with. Uh, the name that always comes up, and I think always, it just always gets overlooked. I don't know why, because you go back and look at his stats, they were insane. Fred Taylor from the Jaguars. Oh, God, so underrated, man. If you watch his highlight tape, yes. I mean, I'm probably all over that thing. But, like, you know, a lot of the greats are, too. Um, and yeah. It was the guy, he could do, he could do whatever he wanted, you know? So usually most guys, they're either big and they're just going to go downhill. That's fine. You know, I mean, I don't care if you run me over as long as I make the tackle. You know, not, <laughs> I'll drag not, you down. <laughs> I'm not trying to be a doormat, but I mean, if, if that's what happens, it happens. You know, everyone gets ran over. But the, the quick guys were annoying, man. It's like, you know, you just, if you're out there in space, it's like, man, I just try to get a hand on this dude. Um, and so... There were so many guys that were, that were really, you know, they, they could do so many. Like, LaDainian Tomlinson had one of the most Ooh. vicious stiff arms, and no one ever really talks about it because he juked no. so many people. Yeah. But if you go back and watch it, he's got some stiff arms of, like, hand to the face mask, back of the helmet hitting the ground, like Derrick Henry type stuff. Wow. And so, I mean, it's, you know, there's so many. Everybody's good. But the Fred Taylor, um, you know, the whole West, when I came in, Steve Jackson, Marshall was just leaving. He was he still was he was still great. End. He was still great. Oh, um, scary. Yeah. yeah. And then I can't even imagine him. I played him his last two years. I can't even imagine seeing him when he was prime or young. Yeah. Um, God, he was good. Steve and Marshall, Frank Gore. Was oh, yeah, Frank Gore. That's right. In yeah. San Francisco, he was still like he's still never is he still the, playing. I mean, <laughs> probably is. We yeah, I know the, somewhere we in MVP far. and Sean Alexander. Yeah, and then a year after I get in the league, the uh, Cardinals trade for Edron James. God, that's right. He finished his career <laughs> in Arizona. I feel wow, like man! All of them belong in the Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, Edge is in. Um, Steve's got the numbers. I think he'll definitely get consideration. Sean, a short career, but he's got an MVP, several Pro Bowls. Yeah. And yeah. Frank's definitely going in. Yeah. Yeah. No, man. That's God. I you're doing a better job at teeing this up than I. I I had forgotten about some of those backs in the NFC West. That was a nutty period. Crazy. And of course, the quarterback. I mean, I watched you. I it's like I'm still watching that moment, man, when you picked off Mark Bolger. Uh I mean, I, you know, I'm cursing was, your name. That was my first. <laughs> My first play of nickel, nickel sub package. What? So when I get in there, all camp, I'm begging. I was like, hey, 
I'm not like really a run stuffer. I'm more of like, I can play both, but I'm better in coverage. So let me play nickel. And they're like, nah, you know, you have a lot to learn with base. Like just stay first and second down. And I was like, whatever. So I didn't get any reps at nickel, not in camp, not in spring, nothing. My boy, D.D. Lewis, we hit each other. We Steve Jackson ducks and we hit each other. And like, we knock each other out. And oh, God. so I'm crawling to the sideline. And I see Dee Dee call on the sideline. I was like, wait a minute. And so the coach grabs me and he goes, Dee Dee's down. Get back in there. And I was like, oh, shit. I, I'm three sheets to the wind. I've never played nickel. So what? I go in there. I played the, the whole second half of, you know, I played every snap from that for, for the, uh, the next half. I probably messed up 80% of the calls, but we got through the game. And, and luckily, my first play was cover two. I knew how to play cover two from college. I get an interception, and um, from that day on, they're like, "Hey, you know, he's gonna he's gonna start getting reps at, at nickel." <laughs> wow, man, playing the deep middle and going, "Okay, I'll give this a shot and cover two. What? Yeah. I was standing there watching that. Oh God, <laughs> brutal, man. That is such a great story. Okay, sticking with this theme, who is your most underrated teammate? Who's somebody that you think is just a stud that we just don't talk about enough? There's there's a lot of them, man. There's probably a lot. I think, you know, on offense, Chris Gray was our, our guard that, you know, um, him and, and Locklear, even on that right side, we averaged more yards on the right side than we did behind the two Hall of Famers. Now, of course, everyone's stacking, you know, the box right. on, on that side with Walt and Hutch, right? Right. But, um, yeah, that whole offensive line was incredible. Tobeck, you know, Oof. Gray and Locklear. But uh, and I don't think they got enough credit, you know, um, when it comes to – because they could do both. They were not just great run blockers. They were excellent pass protection too. And then on defense, um, man, Rocky Bernard was so, so – Oh, wow. I mean, this he, this dude had eight and a half sacks. Yeah. In the D tackle position. And, and I'm saying he probably played a good 70% of the game. Most D tackles, they might play 50%, 40 like – they tap out when they're tired. This guy could just keep going and going. Um, so if I had to say the most underrated, um, pro probably those two. I mean, uh, you know, Bobby Ingram and Joe Juravicious. Uh, oh wow! They, they were they they were pretty vital to our success when uh, D-Jack Daryl Jackson got hurt early in the season. Um, Bobby played most of that season with broken ribs, and um, good grief, man! John Sean Taylor. Hit Bobby oh, with a slant. The slant was a little high. And then he, man, I don't know how Bobby got up. Bobby got up, finished the game, had eight more catches for, for 75 or 80 yards. Um, God, there's a great guy that we don't talk enough about. I mean, as a guy who was a Rams fan, Bobby Ingram was a problem. I mean, oh, he was just – he reminded me a lot of like Henry Ellard back in the day yeah. when he was at the Rams. He just moved the chains, caught everything. Henry Ellard, yeah. How do you lead anybody into Sean Taylor incorrectly? That's <laughs> – you know, I don't even I don't even think half threw it too high. I think just Sean Taylor was that fast and that good, man. I mean, it, God, he was good. That, wow, I man. I watching him pick off Brett Favre twice in a game, and Favre, Favre pumped once. Sean took two steps that way, and then Favre just let it go. Sean just did a baseball turn, like a center fielder, ran down. He was gonna hit the guy, realized he was there too early, jumped up and picked it one hand. And God, man, back to Brett Favre, and he was like, you know, no, no fucking way, that guy just did. <laughs> I still, yeah, I love the Favre mic'd up. He's like, what the hell did I just see? I mean, it was incredible. God, yeah. man, who do you love watch play today? I mean, I love these Ooh. names. You're you're making me go back in time, but who do you really like to watch today? I, I love watching linebackers, obviously. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll give your man credit, Aaron Donald. My God, I mean. He's my guy. I listen to you on Believe talking about AD. He's, he's a nightmare. He's an absolute nightmare. Unreal. You, you can't stop him. You know, he's, it's unreal. Um, so you know, he's he's obviously really fun to watch when he's not playing the Hawks. Um, <laughs> Poor Russ, man. Oh my god! I think he sacked Russ more than any other quarterback in the yeah, league. Yeah, I, I believe Russell. It. God, um, but at linebacker. Uh, obviously, you know, Bobby and KJ, the two of my favorites to watch. Um, and then I really, uh, Leonard from the Colts, uh, Darius, oh, Leonard. Darius Leonard, what a He's, stud. I mean, just the guy makes plays, you know, and that's what I think a lot of, 
a lot of guys, you know, they, they want the big hit or, you know, whatever, but go get the football because that's what changes games. I mean, Leonard had eight forced fumbles this year. Like that's insane production on top of 150 tackles and a top, but he, and then he had a, four or five interceptions, like he gets the ball back and gives the opportunity, the offense more opportunities. And that's, that's the biggest part. And so um, Levante David and um, oh Devin God, White. He's so good. And Devin White. Levante David's not given, if you look at his numbers, he's got Hall of Fame numbers. And he has, yes. you think he's maybe been to one Pro Bowl. It's, it's, it's a shame, man. He, um, it's nuts. He can cover anybody. He covers tight ends and receivers. Yeah, I mean he's and he's a linebacker. I, he's, he's the only one I saw stay with Kelsey in the last couple of years. Yeah, you know Kelsey. Uh, I haven't seen anybody else cover him that well um, when they had the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. Um, trying to think who else. God, I and can't he, wait for you to get back into coaching, uh, man. Micah Parsons. Micah Parsons. Oh, is insane. He's like, nuts, isn't he? It, he's just getting started. He he's nuts. 12, Twelve or thirteen sacks. I mean, I think he missed two games too. It's like that. That is, it's not supposed to happen that easily, you know, as a rookie. <laughs> God, he played, he played DN for the first two games because they lost – who was it? They lost two of their – they asked Gregory and they lost somebody else. They put him down at DN and he had three sacks. <laughs> Unbelievable player, man. Him and you talk about Darius Leonard too, going back to him for a second. He reminds me of London Fletcher. Like, mm. he's a guy that's pulling up, you know, 140 tackles every year, making big plays, and not that's enough people talk stuff. about him. Interceptions, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. talk about him. You got to get back into coaching, man. I see, I see the blood pressure going up when you start talking linebackers. You're like, oh, I, love <laughs> I, I love it, man. It's ah, I, I, I'm missing football right now. I'm going back and watching old football games. That's how sick and twisted I am. God, I'm just as sick and twisted as you are. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm watching your clips the last week since we first connected. That's great, man. Yeah. So, a couple more football questions, and I want to hear about life after football. So <laughs> Uh, what do you miss about the game? What do you love about the game? What do you hate about the game? Even though you love it. We know you just said you yeah. loved it. But there's got to um, be stuff that you're like, eh, I don't miss that, man. Yeah, practice is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Every NFL player. <laughs> and we got to that. If I'm going to be a coach, we can't. I can't be putting that out there. I mean, That's right. We'll dub yeah. that out. We'll it's dub so, that out. <laughs> you know, I think, I think practice is obviously, it's where you win, you know, to prepare for, for the, the upcoming game. But – I think coaches have put too much emphasis on practice to the point where they're like, well, he didn't do it in practice. He's not going to be able to do it in the game. And some, there's a lot of us that when we go out there in the game, we're, we're in another world and we see it like, like the matrix, like Leroy Hill, case in point, it. <laughs> Leroy Hill was one of the worst practice players I've ever seen in my life. I mean, just, I, I don't know what it was, but as soon as we got to the game, he had some, the fewest mental errors, the fewest missed tackles, he was just a gamer, you know? And so then they didn't start him for a while because they didn't feel like they could they could trust him because of the way he prepared. But he was taking notes. He was doing – but when it came to the on-field, there's just some things that he needed a couple of days to clean up. And then by the time we got to Sunday, he was outperforming everybody. And so it's like that's something that I took to coaching. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to judge anybody by practice. Once we get into the preseason, yeah, when we get into preseason of the game, now there's no excuses. Like you're out there and like it's it's you know it's go time. But I'm you know, because there's there's there was guys that, you know, they get all these they make all these plays in practice and then the game comes, it nowhere to be found. It's like disappeared. Yeah, where'd that guy go? Is he out there? Yeah, that was me in high school, man. No. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a name before we move on. I'm gonna give but you wait, a name. What I what I miss, you asked me, but what I miss and love about it, I miss oh, my yeah, I forgot. yeah. I miss my brothers, that 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 yeah. brotherhood, and and I miss I miss game day. I miss the spirit of competition. Of you know you know just yeah. I was not a big fast anything, but when it came when we stepped in between those lines, it was on, and it's just a matter of, of willpower. Like how bad do you want it? I miss that that challenge and that aspect of competition. Is you know like everything on paper says this guy should win every one-on-one -on -one battle with me, but he doesn't, you know, because because you can't measure heart. That's right. God, man, you're too damn humble, by the way. Three-time all, all pro, three-time pro bowler. You're just being humble. We're not going to let you be too humble. Uh, yeah, but that that teammate thing, I, it's so hard to explain to people once you leave. Even with, I don't care if it's, you know, Little League. You just miss, even when you get old and gray like me, you're like, 
God, I miss the dynamic of being on a team. I miss my bros. Yeah, I miss yeah. the team. Yeah, it's something so you're part true. of something bigger than yourself, man. It's it's uh it's indescribable, really, to put it. You can't do it justice putting it into words. God, you got to get back to coaching. That's what I'm pulling out of this interview. We got to get this guy back in okay. in the coaching ranks, man. When those kids are are ready, the, and the wife's the wife's got to bless this one. <laughs> I think, yeah, especially with the pandemic, I'm sure she's ready to kick me out of the house. Get out of the house. <laughs> so, last football question that we got to learn about life after football. And look, this is the guy at the end of the bar. This is the guy you probably want to elbow in the head. And it, and the guy's me. Um, <laughs> linebackers, hmm. are they made or are they born? Ooh, I, it's a good God, question. They're different cats, man. They're, yeah, that, that's for damn sure. They're different uh, cats. <laughs> I, I'm, just, uh, I'm looking at one and I'm saying it. You know, I think there is a, a natural, you know, inclination or something that just drives you to wanting to be a linebacker. I know the – no matter how many touchdowns or rushing yards they had and, you know, on offense, how many great plays, nothing – and I mean nothing compared to a big hit or, or, or taking the ball away from somebody or break, breaking, you know, this sounds fucking terrible, breaking their will. Like, just. Sounds great, man. <laughs> I'm trying. Well, fans are like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah, that, that straight up, I'm going to run through you and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, that, there's no rush like that. And, um, and so. I don't. I don't know if they're born or made, but I, I think maybe they they naturally have that that kind of uh, mentality or that aggression, that aggressive mentality. And my youngest has it, and so I think he's. Ooh. If they're yeah, they're, if they're there's going to be a, a third generation uh, Tatuku, it, it's going to be it. the youngest. Um, and like the oldest, he's big, strong, fast, everything, but he's just he's just too nice. I, I mean, that's great. Him. That's great. Yeah, yeah I it wish, is great. I wish Good I was like that. I wish. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, but I I've seen a lot of guys. You know, like I was I was just breaking down film of Devin Lloyd from uh, Utah. This wow. kid, he went into Utah as a wide receiver, and now he is going to be probably the first linebacker taken uh, three years later. It's wow. so, you know, are they are they made or are they born? I don't know, but I. I think he always had a little bit of that that edge or that nastiness to him, you know, even if he was a receiver. Because there's still – there's aggressive and tough wide receiver. Debo Samuel, right? Oh, God, guy, that guy's unreal. He probably could have played safety or, or linebacker. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, man, good question. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, I, I mean, this is one of those, you know, guys, wannabes. We all sit around and go, no, 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 linebackers, man. Are they made or are they born? Because, God, they're just so damn different on any team. I mean, they're just – different cats and and i'm talking to one like i know something but no you, it's, you're right you, it's yeah you watch them and you go that guy's they're just a different group those three or four guys <laughs> sure. okay you kind of settled it nice segue into post football like you've had a really great success you're a good family man dad husband all that good stuff but football doesn't usually end great if correct me if i'm wrong i think you you ended with a torn pec injury right yeah. uh my and second, that was I had two of those. Good. I mean, we watched Eric Weddle tear his peck in the Super Bowl, and then he was trying to run around with one arm, making yeah. hits all. You were probably going, "Yeah." I, I, I as soon as as soon as it happened, I said he just tore his peck because I knew. saw I saw him grab it and I saw him do the chicken wing. Yeah, I go, I go, he tore his peck, and uh, and if it just comes off the bone, it's painful, and you know, but I'm I can't, you know. The, the adrenaline, I do know from playing in the Super Bowl, the adrenaline so high that that's not going to keep you off. He braced it up. So when we were playing the Cardinals, that's when my first one tore. Mm. And, and I was like, ah, that didn't feel good. I don't know what that was. I played a couple more snaps. And then I tackle Fitzgerald, Larry Fitzgerald, and my safety comes over the top and hits my shoulder, and it rips down the middle. And, <laughs> and so that one, Damn. I was like, ah, I told I was like, hey, Hawthorne, get your ass in here. Uh, I'm going to need a minute. Oh. So I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's it snaps and then it's gone. It's like it's really not that painful after it snaps, but you you have no power. It's incredibly hard to run because you don't realize how much you use your pec in you know everyday activities, especially yeah. running. Um, in fact, Leroy tore his groin like the week before. He was back. He was back in six weeks because that's a muscle that can attach 
and and not be as a long of a but mine was four and a half months, five months. And so wow. Yeah. But then when I went to Atlanta, I strained it during OTAs, mini camp, and then um, I tore it eventually lifting. And um, and that really wasn't what you know, in a way it probably saved me because I had had so many concussions. I was that, about to ask and you, yeah. you took yep. So yeah, we'll go there. So I yeah. had, that was my tenth surgery. Uh you know, wow, which, which man. is a good amount of surgeries to have. Oh, we take, uh, God. But then, I mean, um, I, I really, I still didn't feel like I had ever recovered from my last couple of concussions. You know, I just played through them. And um, it's, you know, man, from that point, you know, my health was really just deteriorating. Even I was just going through the motions. Even even when I was coaching, I was, yeah. I was 280 pounds. You know, Ugh, I can't even see you that big, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. You're a six footer, right? You're five eleven, six feet. Five eleven, six feet. I, yeah, I okay. Five eleven and seven eighths at the combine. Uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't give me that one eighth of an inch. But um, so you know, yeah, and at two eighty, man. I mean, you know, everybody when they saw me, they were like, "Oh, what are you know, two sixty? I was like, "Yep," like you know, I. I but I guess <laughs> if you could carry it well, I guess I did. But you know, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was tough. My my joints, my everything was just, uh, you know, in, in pain. And, um, and, you know, I ended up getting into the, uh, I bought some real estate in the cannabis industry. Um, okay, here we go. And, and yeah. And so me and my I was leading you there and you're just taking me there, man. He's well, a captain. He's a linebacker yeah. folks. Yeah. I wanted it zoning CBD, right? Yeah. This well, changed first, you. It started. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I get, I owe my life and the quality of life that I know because of it. And, um, but before that, I just got into the you know industry on the real estate side as an investment with one of my friends, Matt McCoy, one of my brothers. I've known him since we were 18 years old. He was at San Diego state. And I was at SC and um, just became great friends. And we finished our last year here in 2010 uh, with the Hawks. And um, and then we stayed put, right? And I ended up going into coaching several years later. But we bought some some property to a couple buildings. And we were just going to, you know, play landlord and, and rent them out and, you know, and um, leave all the hard work to other people. Because, <laughs> I mean, all we knew about cannabis is that we did enjoy it. You know, we didn't know anything about growing it or anything else full-time job yeah like, you, you are not a gardener like people think you are not a botanist you are a, you're a farmer like that yeah. when you're bringing slash down scientist when, slash yeah when you're bringing yeah, down I mean, family crops so it's um uh, and we had a small grow it's actually scaling up now but that from night like, from 2015 we ended up taking over operations and uh, we developed the brand 1937 Farms just to try to educate people about the the year of prohibition, the Marijuana Tax Act. You oh, know? nice. And so, yeah, we, we've been lied to for over almost 100 years now. Well, yeah, 80 right now. But and about what this plant is and what it can do for us, you know, and, and, and everybody. And so, um, you know, as I was in the industry, you know, working with Matt to develop that brand and bring it to market, uh, I started hearing more and more about CBD. And um, you know, I started just doing my research and due diligence and, and you know, started R&D, buying products, you know, reading the labels. First time I, this has led me to a healthier self because I actually read food labels now to see like what's in there because, yeah, yeah I mean, because I, as, long as, as long as the package is nice and shiny, everybody's like, oh, it must be, it's really clean. It's beautiful. You know, right? you, know you look at the back and see what's in there. And so. Um, I think the one thing that, that really the cannabis industry did was they were so stringent that they make you put every everything on there from what's in there, you know, the amount of THC, all the other uh, minor cannabinoids, uh, the compounds, plant compounds. Yeah. They also make sure it's clean of residual solvents, heavy metals, toxins, and pesticides. And so with that in mind, you know, I, I was just looking at everything, I was floored with how many people were not good players in the industry. And yeah. so um, I finally came across one product that was super clean and they do things the right way. I actually even met their, uh, the owners, um, uh, Fairwinds Cannabis and they're good friends of ours, James and Wendy Hall, they're uh, out of Vancouver, Washington, and uh, they do things the right way. You know, and I started, I was like, hey man, you guys have a very high quality product and um, it's led to a 
It's it's a it was a capsule, very low dose, so microdose in THC. Okay. Um, and I'm talking within days, I was sleeping better. God, my, my inflammation was down, and I mean there are there are TED talks about how sleep deprivation is can ruin anybody's mindset. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't care what kind of shape you're in. If you're not getting quality sleep, you're not going to stay at that peak performance. And, um, and so my life just turned around. I went from 280 pounds back down to 235 and I've held this weight for seven wow. years now. I'm two, wow. 238, 240 right now. And, uh, I've held this weight for seven years now. And, um, wow. and I mean, in every facet, um, whether it's work, family, I've just become, you know, incredibly more productive and happy. Um, not high, which is important right. for a lot of the, you can, you can be happy and not high. And, you know, that's the stigma we're trying to erase. And I'm grateful for all the athletes that try to do it. So when the, when the, when the hemp bill got passed in 2018, December of 18, I put together a team and, you know, we, because the only, let me back it up. The only difference between hemp and cannabis is the varying amounts of THC. So industrial hemp has very little to no THC, um, 0.3% below or below, which is why it's very legal. And um, and that's the, that's how the farm bill got passed it's because they, they can't get you high. And it's only made me the best version of myself. And from- Incredible. From a neuroprotectant, which is great for the brain and all the concussions, you know, to better sleep, which we know how much more productive that'll make you the following day. Um, an appetite uh, control, whether you need to eat more, because people, when they get stressed and their cortisol raises. This guy. You, you, <laughs> right? you either yeah. you, you do something, you know, we have coping mechanisms, right? Whether it's oh, yeah. have a drink, yep, go binge eat, right? Um, yeah. Stress to eat. I had all those things. And so now I can actually look at a situation that would normally stress me very, you know, objectively rather than subjectively and, and make a better decision than I would in the past. So it's, I mean, it's insane what it's done for me in terms of getting to know myself in a better, in the, the best level, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically that I ever have. And I was once, uh, you know, in, in at the peak of football. Yeah. You know? And, and I didn't know myself like this. And that's that's what's crazy to think. Like, what if I had this back then? Like, I mean, so I yeah. I, I try to tell all these players, you know, now um, that because you won't you won't fail a drug test for it um, to, to actually consider putting in their regimen because it, it's I, I would have played at least even with all those surgeries. If I had this when I was 31 after my last surgery, I would have played another five years. I guarantee. Wow, you. man. I guarantee you. That's insane. I'm not saying I would have been a pro bowler. Yeah, but you were. <laughs> no, no, but but I would have played another five years. I mean, I'm I'll be 40 in November, and I'm I'm dunking a basketball again at 240 pounds. And I, dude, I'm sitting here, uh, just sitting here thinking I, I got to get off the screen with this guy. You look like Adonis, man. I mean, you're in good shape. I, this blows the water. So, folks who are listening or watching, zoneincbd.com. Yep. Please go check that out. Lofa is behind that program. That's his company. And this just blows out of the water all the traditional goofy stigmas around CBD. Like you're going to sit around and eat Cheetos and be no. 600 pounds and your brain is going to be fried. It's the polar opposite. Just the opposite. Zone in, baby. And, you know, and even, you know, because we're, we're, we're full, you know, you know, funded by a bunch of athletes, a bunch of my, my friends and family. And, um, you know, even the, the, the word or the name zone in was it's a playoff positive, you know, psychology flow state being in the zone. Right. The athletes, right. And um, and really, that's that's really what I just try to tell people is that it's just it has put my life into focus to where nothing can affect me. Um, you know, it's 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 crazy. I'm forever grateful, and this is, you know, my new mission um, in life. I, three years before we started the company, I was just buying quality CBD and, you know, uh, full spectrum product, and just handing it out to all friends and family. And I was right. watching some of them. It was, I would start getting emails and texts like, "Hey, did you know it does this? Hey, did you know it does that?" And so I, I can see why a lot of people. Um, they think it's snake oil or whatever. And, you know, they might have tried, 
Yeah. yeah, placebo, you know, but they might have tried a product that, you know, probably didn't have any CBD in it. And or, right. or even there's three there's three different um, kinds of CBD. You got the isolate, which is just the compound as limited to very little effects. Then you got broad spectrum, which is everything but THC. OK, you'll get, you know, and it's got better effects. You'll you'll you'll, you'll definitely notice something with that. And then full spectrum, which is everything, including the very um you know, trace amounts of THC, but, you know, also the terpenes and flavonoids and everything in the plant, the whole plant extract. Um, and I mean, it's, it's incredible what all of them, you know, do together in synergy to just put you, your mind and body back together in one. It's, um, I haven't felt this good since high school, man. God, that's such, I got to tell you, as people who watch you guys on Sundays, and totally freaking admire you guys to know that you're doing okay health wise is a big deal. And I want to get that message out on this format as much as I can. I also follow Kyle Turley, who's very yeah. boisterous and open about it. Kyle, um, yeah. And look, folks, it's all natural. This isn't, you know, we're not talking about opiates here. We could, we've seen the dangers there. If we want to learn about CBD and it's not just sitting in a dark room alone with a bong, can yeah. we go to zoneincbd.com and yeah. learn? Like you just yeah. mentioned those three segments. I didn't even know that. Yeah, absolutely. You okay. More. And, you know, Kyle, that he's a hero of mine. Um, he's an Ricky animal. Williams. Ricky Williams was <laughs> Oh, right yeah, Ricky Williams. Yeah, of course. All, like everybody, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's. This, I'm telling you, the hemp and cannabis plant, which, you know, hemp, it is a cannabis genus plant. It's the same plant, um, just lower THC. But property-wise and structurally in terms of the compounds that, it's made of comprised of is the same, you know, same exact thing. The only thing is it's illegal to extract from cannabis because it's not federally legal right now. Right. So that's why, yeah. hemp, you know, the, the brother or sister plant is what everybody's going to right now. But uh, these are the plants that are going to save us. I, I'm, I, I'm talking us from ourselves and then us as a society, man, it's, um, you know, and I, I try not to talk too crazy like that. Cause a lot of people are yeah. like, Oh, this guy's crazy. No, nope, this forum is for this. We want people to be healthy, man. Yeah, you only going to be the best version of yourself, which is, I think, really what we all what life's about. What we, you know, try to do is uh, do as much good as we can while we're here, because we're not here very long, and, yep. and, and just you know, self betterment. Um, just try to try to be the best person we can. And you've you've probably got the unique perspective in closing. I won't keep you much longer, but in closing, you've got the unique perspective of looking at like your dad's generation and what they dealt with. My generation, I'm kind of in that generation, yeah. and then what you now can pass on to your kids, yeah. and the knowledge is only getting greater about what's right here on the damn planet. Man. It's right here. Well, it, so you know, my dad when he passed, 54 years old. You know, that's, that's how old I am. That's 15 years from for me from now. Yeah. Like that's that's not that long. And um, nope. you know, he was actually in relatively decent, you know, shape. He went of a heart attack, but um he had sleep apnea, which I didn't know I had. I suffered from it my whole life. This has helped me with that. Yeah. Does it help you with this? Yeah. So I actually get into my REM sleep. I actually require less sleep. I used to require probably eight to nine hours of sleep. Um, wow. and, and now I'll sleep probably five to six hours because I'm getting such good sleep, but I still, I use a CPAP machine. Um, okay. That, yep. That, I got that. <laughs> it's, it's tough, right? To, you know, Darth Vader, man, every night. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, that's actually, it's helped me with that too. Like, so if I'm traveling and if I don't have my CPAP, you know, I use that, I use it every night and just to get better more restful sleep and um and you know it's uh it's incredible how it changes everything a mind shift um but what it does it works on our cells i, I know i don't want to get too i know that's okay man hit us with this this is listen you've been hitting guys full speed for two decades now's the time to talk about how the hell you're recovering from that <laughs> yeah and uh you know plant medicine and so it's um you know it's incredible what it does but it, it you know it acts on our cells and so you know, in many ways, I have I'm have gotten more defined than I was when I was playing, even 10 years ago, you know, uh, when I was 27, 28. Um, same lifts, but there's there's a, a heightened sense of awareness between the cells and you know and muscle recruitment in my workout because of and I, I guess the easiest way to explain it is um I was outside and I've never put sunscreen on, but I was outside one day. Um and 
it was hot. The sun was finally out in Seattle. And I was like, God, I was like, is it just me? Or is like, you know, I feel like I'm burning. And my wife, kids, everybody's running around. They're like, no, it's actually pretty nice out. And I was like, I reached for the sunscreen. I've never put sunscreen on in my life. <laughs> so usually, tell guy. So yeah, tell. Usually, usually I just burn. Usually I just burn because I can't feel it. Right. I don't, my wow. cells, my cells aren't that. Oh, that isn't good. Yeah. I, I, I just, I just like, ah, oh, it's like, you know, it's hot or whatever. And then like days later, I'm like, man, you know, I got sunburned pretty bad. And my wife's making fun of me because I didn't put the sun, sunscreen on. Well, now like <laughs> I'm so in tune with the moment and my mind and body that I'm out there. I'm like, Ooh, let me get that sunscreen. Like I can feel the skin and my skin telling me like, Hey, you're going to burn right now. We are going to burn, put some sunscreen on. And I know wow. that sounds crazy, but that's how that's how sensitive or in tune I am. My mind and body are back in sync. Interesting, man. I got to tell you, totally unexpected. I've learned a couple things the last ten minutes. I I'm going to check this out. I'm going to send you some. Yeah. I, oh, I would love that, man. Yeah. And I and I have been all over that website, folks. If you're interested, if you're dealing with chronic pain, inflammation, this stuff, please listen into what Lofa, a middle linebacker, has to say. ZoneInCBD.com. Go check that out. and We can get educated there, too. I tell you, man, I've kept you a long time. I thank you so much uh, for joining us here on Gridiron Icon, talking football, talking about life after football, which I don't think gets talked about enough. And, and that's what we're trying to create that here. But if you want to hang out with Lofa or connect with him. You can find him on Twitter at Lofa Tatupu 51 Yeah, we know the number. And also he is the host of Believe in Seahawks podcast on the Believe Network. And then we just talked about zoneincbd.com, which is critical to long-term health. My friend, anything else you'd like to share with us? No, man, I appreciate you having me. Uh, stay blessed. Uh, thank you, everybody that, that you know, zoned in on this segment. And uh, shout out to my boy, Cromwell. That oh, God, we didn't one. even talk about it. We'll talk so, about it next one. Uh, I'm having you on again. We're going to go deep dive on this health piece, too. And yes, folks listening, I take a lot of shit for my love of Nolan Cromwell as my idol as a kid. This guy played under him. He was one of his coaches. So, man, really special moment. Thank you. Right on, brother. All right, well, stay blessed, and uh, thank you for having me. Let's do it again soon. Anytime, Lofa. We're here for you. Thanks again. Follow Lofa on Twitter, folks, and we will see you again soon.